And good evening, everybody, and welcome to your library. My name is David Leonard, BPL president, and tonight's program is part of our author talk series and also highlighted within our Remparing America series. We know that tonight's program was originally scheduled uh, for June 21st, uh, but that was the day that the city of Boston was observing Juneteenth. And so we are grateful that we were able to have our guest reschedule uh, for tonight. But we understand that many of you may be choosing to watch the program in recorded format as opposed to live. But thank you to those of you who are joining us live this evening. I'm broadcasting tonight from the Central Library in Boston's Copley Square uh, from the new building on Boylston Street. A few points to orient you to tonight's program. If you are joining us live, we are broadcasting via Zoom. As a participant or viewer, your microphones and video will remain off. We'll use the chat box to share supplemental information for tonight's program. But if you'd like to ask a question, you can do that through the Q&A button and we'll get to as many questions as possible in the second half of tonight's program, including a couple submitted at registration. We also draw your attention to the live transcript button, which is active currently. You can toggle that on and off as you so choose. And as it is an AI, we apologize in advance for anything it gets wrong. Tonight's bookstore partner is Frugal Bookstore here in Boston a longtime partner of the Boston Public Library in Nubian Square. Their information is available on the screen and in chat. In addition, of course, for other books by tonight's author, we encourage you to check out your local library in person or online, or an independent bookstore wherever you might be, in addition to Frugal Bookstore, from which you can also order online. This program will be recorded and published on the BPL websites and channels following the program. As part of our Repairing America series, it provides us this theme, an opportunity to engage with issues facing our country and try to bend our arc of history a little more directly towards justice for all. It also gives us the opportunity to give voice to leaders, experts and commentators, and their issues, many of whom may not always have been afforded such an opportunity. Tonight, we are in conversation with our guest, Dax Devlin Ross, about his new book, Letters to My White Male Friends. After the murder of George Floyd in 2020, America's ongoing systemic racism crisis was once again headline news. In the wake of mass protests, many white people started wondering what they could do to be better allies in the fight for racial justice. White men were and are finally realizing that simply not being racist is not enough to end racism. We want deeper insight, not only into how racism has harmed black people, but perhaps for the first time into how it has harmed us all. Letters to my white male friends promises to help men who have said they are committed to change and to develop the capacity to see, feel, and sustain that commitment so that they, we, can help secure racial justice for us all. Our author guest, Dax Devlin Ross, is the author of five books, and his journalism has been featured in Time, The Guardian, The New York Times, Virginia Quarterly Review, The Washington Post Magazine, and other national publications. He won the National Association of Black Journalists Investigative Reporting Award for his coverage of jury exclusion in North Carolina courts and is currently a reporting fellow at Type Investigations, a New York City teaching fellow turned nonprofit executive. Dax is now a principal at the social impact consultancies Dax Dev and Third Settlements, both of which focus on designing disruptive strategies to generate equity in workplaces and education spaces alike. Dax, welcome to the program. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, would you like to get us started with perhaps a story of uh, what led to the creation of this book? Um, first of all, thank you so much for having me, David, and just for the, the library as a whole, for, uh, for just welcoming me to be in this space to share with your community. Um, so thank you for that. Um, yes, I wanna, uh, I'm gonna do a little bit of a short presentation. Um, I don't even want to call it a presentation. I'm going to tell a short story that leads into the book, hopefully, maybe gives folks a little bit more of an insight into, 
into who I am and how I came to write this story and what the history is behind it. So I'm gonna do a bit of a, a screen share that's gonna help facilitate this uh, opportunity for us to do some collective learning together. All right, so on the screen in front of you, and I'm gonna make sure that it's uh, full screen for everybody to see it, is a picture. This is a picture of me and my dad and my, my little brother when I graduated from high school way, way back in 1993. And I've looked at this picture for now, you know, more than half my life. And I've always wondered why my dad wasn't smiling. You know, this was a proud moment. And he stands there and is this sort of, perhaps some, some element of, of um, I don't know if happiness is the right word, but it, some satisfaction might be there, a measure of it, but there's something missing for me. And so I was, I always wondered about that. And so I started to think about and do some digging into his life story. And what are the things that begin, there's a myriad of things that begin to emerge, but in particular, what starts to emerge is that my father is raised, he's born in the 1940s, early 1940s. He's raised in the South during a period in which education segregation was the law of the land, at least part of the country he was in. My father is also the same age as Emmett Till. He was born the same summer, as a matter of fact. They are 10 days apart in age. And I can imagine that when Emmett Till's mangled body, the image of his mangled body was displayed in Jet Magazine because his, Emmett Till's parents wanted the world to see what had happened to their child, how their child had been mutilated. My father is the same age when this is happening. He could have been Emmett Till. My father's also growing up at a time in the 1950s when there are literacy text, tests and poll taxes in states throughout the South, but in Virginia where he was being raised. And so I imagine that part of what he's encountering is to some extent the ways in which his family, his mother, his father, his uncle, his aunts, all the people in his life are trying to navigate um, their ability to express their right as Americans to participate in our democracy. This is a picture of my dad graduating from Howard University, 1964, May 1964. This is significant. And if you can look at this image, you see he's actually in the front of his class. He graduated, he was the president of the engineering class at Howard University. This is a significant moment for his family's life because he's the first in his family to graduate from college. As a matter of fact, he'd, he had done well enough on the standardized test at the time to be admitted to the University of Virginia, but when they found out he was black, they actually paid for him to go to Howard rather than have him attend the University of Virginia. That same summer, the Civil Rights Act of 1964 is passed. So the world that my father is literally entering at 22 years old is a world that's a flux and change, transition and opportunity. And one of the pillars of that opportunity for him will be affirmative action. The work that he does in many ways is in, he's, as an engineer, he's working with governments, big and small, local and state and national. So what affirmative action is able to do for him and for his friends, many of the people I grew up around, civil engineers, mechanical engineers, architects, all of these are his friends and they were all the beneficiaries of this moment in time. And then I come along, here I am. You can see me in the corner. There I am, the little arrow pointing to where this is Janney Elementary in the early 1980s in Washington, DC. So this is, as I say, and part of what I contend in the book is that I am a part of the first generational cohort that emerges out of the civil rights movement. And you can see a bit of the diversity that's beginning to reflect itself in that school that I attend in Washington, DC. Here is a picture of my soccer team when I'm 12 years old. And again, you can see the myriad images of young, young boys of various backgrounds together playing soccer. And there's me in the back, with the arrow, one of the bigger kids. And later I attend Sidwell Friends, a Quaker school in Washington, DC. And here again, you see me on a team with many of my white friends. But while all of this is happening, while I am coming of age, there's also this larger backdrop, this other story, this story that is emerging and playing out outside of the walls of the buildings that I am being educated in, 
but very much a part of the city that I'm being raised in. And I imagine also in places like Boston as well. This is the story of mass incarceration. And by the end of the 1990s, it's beginning to take hold of even friends in my life. It's becoming part of my story, part of my experience. And then in 1992 in particular, I'm a junior in high school. And this is the year in which the acquittal of the three officers that beat Rodney King becomes publicly known and it sets off this uprising, this revolt in Southern California in Los Angeles. And then as we move forward, we understand and many of us begin develop a literacy around this, of course, now around this infamous 1994 crime bill that has had such deleterious effect on black communities, on brown communities across the country. I tell you this because I go back to that picture of my father and I wonder why he's not smiling in this picture. And I think about the fact that he also went through and experienced things. He broke down barriers for himself, his family, for his community. All of, all of that only to see that cycle begin to return, that cycle for his son to reemerge, the thing that he thought he'd reemerged from. So people have asked me why I wrote the book, and there's a lot of reasons why I wrote the book, and I'll talk about those as we get into our experience a bit more together. But a big part of writing this book was because my father couldn't write this book. In one level, he couldn't write this book because his life was not one in which it presented him with opportunities to be connected in any kind of deep and personal way with his white friends growing up or with white boys, white people growing up. He went to segregated schools, lived in a very segregated town. He had a segregated educational experience. Then secondarily, there's also the element of latitude. He didn't have the latitude that I have now, the latitude to speak frankly about parts of our society that we all know need to be repaired, restored so that we can move forward. So in the wake of Father's Day, just a few days past us now, I wanted to just open by sharing a bit about one of the people behind my journey. My mother is another person behind my journey, of course, but my father and the importance of his story, its connection to my own and the circularity of our experiences of black men as black men. And so I'll pause there so that we can get into the program proper. And thank you, David, for giving me that space to offer that opening. Can't hear you, I think you're on mute. There you, you know, go. you'd think after 15 months, I'd have gotten used to this by now. Uh -huh. Thank you for, uh, for that. Thank you for sharing your story and part of your family story as well, because I think personal context is, uh, is everything as we grapple with these difficult issues. Um, um, the, the title is an unusual title as well. Mm -hmm. um, Letters to my white male friends. Yeah. Um, how, how did you... How did you settle on the title? And, and who are these white male friends that you're you talking to? Yeah, um, I mean, the, the title settled on me. Um, you know, I have always been a fan of the epistolary, the epistolary form, the letter writing form as a means by which to communicate something intimate to a large audience that yet still feels very personal. When I first felt inclined to write the letter initially that I wrote last summer, which became the book. At the time that letter was titled a letter to my white male friends of a certain age, because I, I wanted to have a, a conversation with friends that I had gone to elementary school with, middle school with, high school with, college with, law school with, friends whose bar mitzvahs I had gone to, friends whose weddings I had gone to, who've been my best friend. These are folks who've been part of my journey. And I think that's, I had a conversation earlier today with another one of my, my black friends and we talk about what it means to have relationships across difference, particularly racial difference at this point in time, when it can sometimes feel as though you're being asked to draw lines and stand on one side or the other. And for us, it's just not possible to do that. Our lives are too blurred and blended and there are too many people that we care about and that care about us so that we need to find a way to talk to each other about this stuff. So for me, it was a way to engage with the people who I knew intimately across my lifespan. And it wasn't intended in any way to go beyond that. Yeah, I'm a writer, of course, maybe it would be the case that this letter would expand beyond, but I didn't write it with the expectation that it would go and be something more than 
and certainly not become a book. But that's ultimately where the title came from. It was as simple as a spark came. I wrote a piece, I put it out in the world and, and people reacted and responded. And I felt it was necessary to go a little deeper. And so it really was for people who are your actual actual oh. friends or people that you've, you'd cross paths with. So yeah. it's, not, it's not necessarily um, hypothetical friends or friends yet to, I mean, we just met, met yeah. earlier, but I, in some ways I, I feel like, well, is this book addressed to me? And, uh, <laughs> here we are. Well, I mean, I think that there's, I think what happens is that, you know, people have asked me like, are these letters, because there's a series of letters in here. And I do think that at different points in the story of these letters, I was thinking about particular people and individuals who I've had conversations with. I think I did need to hone in on specific relationships at particular points in time in order to make sure I did create some specificity because to make things too broad, I think would to lose the ability to actually connect. I mean, some folks have even asked, well, why didn't you make the story just to, to, your, to your white friends? Why did you make it specifically to men? And you know, I, I, I take that feedback and I appreciate that some folks might feel like it excludes and exclusionary. But what I wanted to do is at least be clear about um, the people who I felt directly connected to, and particularly people who I felt my white friends who often feel like they have no role in these conversations, or they, they tend to obscure the conversations, or they avoid them, or that whenever we do talk about race, it gets reframed into something else. I just wanted us to hold this thing, because if you care about me, and we've been in a relationship for a long time, then I need you to understand that this is something I have to move around with in the world. And we need to be able to talk about it because it's not all good. It isn't. And we'll get to the book in a, in a second, but my sense is from, from reading it that part of the experience that you are sharing is of growing up in you know, going to all boys schools, uh, playing on all boys teams. So the maleness or the male identity within the context of what you're sharing seems to be uh, part of the context of your story. Yeah, I mean, I will say the schools, I never went to any all male schools. I played, I mean, I went well, to the, schools that were, into, that, teams, that, right. that were that were co-ed schools, absolutely. But the sports team fact, factor was huge. I mean, that's the way in which I think, you know, even to this day, that's where a lot of our social exchange initially takes place. And the question, and even now as adults, that's, if you think about how the mode, the dominant mode in which men, even men across difference seem to interact and exchange is through sports. It becomes a medium and metaphor. And I sometimes feel like it's also a way to obscure and avoid, you know, another kind of conversation about things. But absolutely, it was um, the awareness of um, my own negotiation and navigation through, through spaces in which I felt as though deep relationship was being built and sustain that allowed me to at least speak with some level of authority and authenticity. And that's what's very clear and very important to me about how I write in general, but specifically with this book, it felt like I wanted to make sure that I was operating within my lane too. You know, like there are, I gotta stay in my lane. Who do I, who, what, what, what identities do I hold? What competence do I have? And who do I have a direct line of communication with? Let's work in that space because there are other people who have the ability to speak to other people in other spaces, this is where I can own and I can stand as a, part, as a, as a participant in this important dialogue. Um, be before picking up the, the book, I, I wasn't sure whether I would encounter um, a history um, yeah. or, or a storyteller uh, yeah. or an autobiography um, yeah. or a political critique. Mm. And I honestly think um, I got a little of all of that. Uh, yeah. Yeah. What, 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 is that is that fair? Yeah, I mean, I'm a, so thank you for first, first of all, having that kind of a, for, for noticing the ways in which it was being organized. I mean, I fundamentally believe as a storytelling, we're storytelling people, so we need story. We, we, we thrive on story, story helps us understand the world. So I wanted to situate the things that I wanted to experience and I wanted, I wanted my readers to experience, my audience to experience through the lens of a narrative. And I do share parts of my journey and I say I do that for a purpose and with an intention. It is not my intention for people to read this story and to feel bad for Dax. Dax is okay in the world. And I don't want people to have this sense that, and I do think sometimes the part of the ways in which um, we can interact with black stories is through the, through the lens of trauma that black folks are experiencing. And that is valid. And I do have some experiences of quote unquote trauma that I am navigating. 
But my ultimate objective in this story is to use my story as a way to toggle between the personal and the social and political, to be able to talk about social and political and even legal things that were taking place as we were coming of age, as a generation was coming of age, to help people make some deeper connections to the why behind the belief that they might hold. Because my sense is that if you are not fully conscious and aware of the context in which you are shaped and molded and developed, you can miss a lot. And you might have a very underdeveloped understanding of what's going on. And that's what I wanted to make sure I did in this book was to create sort of a, a, a narrative that helped do some lens development, some ability, some, some uh, and to invite people to reflect on their own stories, not just as personal experiences, but within a, a larger social and political context as things were taking place. To, to that end, maybe let's pick up a couple of elements of letters and there's one early on that I, I just gave you a heads up about yeah. when we were talking before the program, uh, which which was uh, which struck me right out of the gate as, as something that was incredibly insightful. And I think that's why you shared it. But tell us about this observation of a man moonwalking at a club <laughs> in Cape Town. Yeah. And so I'm so glad that you picked up on that. Nobody else is asking about that. And I've only asked. And sometimes I ask myself, like, what is that there for? It is, so the story, and I, and I do hope people pick up the book, so I hope you get this, but what I, um, when I was in Cape Town years ago, I was, I'll never forget being in a club one night, and it was a square dance floor, and I remember looking out on this dance floor, and there was this lone, lone person, lone gentleman, moonwalking by himself, and he was moonwalking across, I mean, a, 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 around the perimeter of the dance floor. And there was something just to me that was, at first, you know, you kind of see something unusual and out of the ordinary, you laugh, you poke fun at it. You find a hill, so you get everybody else's attention. Look at this, look at this, look at this person over here. You find humor in it. And but what then, year would this have been approximately? This is like, this is like 1999. This is when I'm in law school. Right. This is like, this is the year before, two, this is the cusp of the new millennium. So, you know, this is long ago, but not ancient history, I'd say. Like, you know, long enough, but not ancient history. But what I what what I took away from that because I I was so engrossed in watching this person move in this way I went up in the I remember I went up in the balcony and I looked down and I watched him, and it occurred to me that there was something very liberatory about his movement. There was some way in which he was um, he he was completely sort of indifferent to everybody around him and to the things that were taking place, and he was in his own space in his own being. And the reason I used that for me as a kind of story to narrative to begin the book was in order to write a book like this, in order to tell a story like this, which actually has some very hard truths that does some, ask some very hard questions and that presents some very challenging sort of um, ways of seeing and viewing the world. I needed to be able to understand and let go of some of the own, some of the socialization that I had experienced. And some of the socialization that I experienced as a black man is that, or as a person in society is that I am not supposed to have certain conversations with white men, particularly white men in power. They are not supposed to be challenged. They are not supposed to be called in and asked to be, to be accountable for, for the society that we have built and that they continue to prosper as a result of and sit and continue to hold an incredible amount of advantage and wealth and relationship to. So in order for me to write this, I had to do some shedding of my own and I had to almost become that person who was like, I have my own, I have developed some learnings about the world, I have drawn some conclusions, and I'm going to present them to you for you to do with as you will, but I'm not going to do it with fear and anxiety and concern that your feelings are going to be hurt or that you're going to use your power in some way to silence me. I'm going to say what I need to say. So that was part of what, and knowing that my father couldn't do that, and that men of his generation, because their job was to lay a foundation, men and women of their generation, Black folks in particular, where their job was to lay a foundation, they didn't have the latitude to do that. I do. And so what do I do with that? Do I stay silent? Do I use my voice? Do I express? I've chosen the latter. Thank you. It's, it's always striking to me that unexpected moments can give us cause to just re-examine who we are, who we want to be, yeah. Uh, what's acceptable to others? Do I live by what's acceptable to others, or do I do I somehow rediscover who I am and go with that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
why, why not moonwalking in a club in Cape Town? Uh, you know? Why not? Why not? If, if I could take you back to um, your, your school years, yeah. um, because I think in another letter, in another section, you're talking a little bit about going to private school, uh, but playing basketball with, uh, with the boys in the neighborhood. And mm-hmm. there's some, dis- 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 some discordant realization that occurs oh, um, throughout that period. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, 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 years ago, I, I described it for myself and defined it as a tr- living in a triangle. Like in DC is a small place, 16 square miles. And, you know, it's broken into these four quadrants, Northeast, Northwest, Southeast, Southwest. And the most the majority of my life has lived in the, no- the upper Northwest quadrant, if you will. But so I, I lived in a neighborhood called Shepherd Park, it's, you know, still exists, obviously, but it was at that time a predominantly black middle class neighborhood. But then I went to school in what was called west of the park, west of Rock Creek Park at Sidwell, which was a predominantly white part of the city. And then I played basketball in uh, in downtown Northwest, which is a predominantly at that time, um, predominantly black and also predominantly um, um, it was predominantly poor. And it was also just a neighborhood that had been impacted dramatically by the riots in 1960s. So there was a significant, you know, in many cities, we know this in 1968, after the Dr. King's assassination, many, many cities were just completely devastated. And DC was one of them, and particularly this part of the city. So I was traveling through those three worlds, playing and uh, going to school, but playing basketball. And what I encountered was that in none of those worlds, after a certain point, did I feel as though I actually had, I, w- I had a foot, a toehold in all of them, but not felt, did I no longer, even in my own neighborhood, no longer felt completely at home and at ease. So at Sidwell, you know, you're in an environment where you are an extreme minority, not just from a racial perspective, but even from a class perspective, right? And then I go and play basketball. I get on a bus, take two buses across town right after school. And I find myself in a neighborhood where, or in a, on a team in which I am seen as the most privileged person in the building. And in many ways, it, 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 it sparks resentment amongst my play, my, my teammates. And then I happened to go home in the evening and be in this other experience. And as a 14 year old, you're not able to put language to those sorts of things, but you're navigating them. I'm navigating them because I have a passion for what I wanna do. But I, 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 do, I do think that it had some, in, some deep impact on my, um, and the work I do in the world now, the writing that I do, but it was hard as a young person because you're, you're not finding a, a world in which you feel completely at home and you feel as though you're not fully able to sort of be part of the communities that you're, that you're immersed in from your sort of as, as part of your, your, your sort of your life, if you will. Like I think teenage years can be lonely enough without exactly, right? <laughs> three worlds that you don't really feel fully part of. Right. Um, but but it, it does seem that's the experience that allows you now, having integrated all of that, to write a book such as this. Yes. Yeah, yeah. I think without a doubt, like um, one of I think the you know folks have thought that maybe I'm offering a critique of my experience of Sidwell as an independent school, and yes, there's a critique in this book, right? But it is not a critique that is without. Um, and I think you, I offer a critique that's that's laden in an understanding and deeply respectful of, and and sort of and has. A, an appreciation for the experience itself. So I think the ability for me to write a book that it seems to be at least at this early phase um, is one that people can respond to, that you know, why, that my target audience can pick up, can read, can feel like it's directly calling them to action and calling them to account, but at the same time is offering something on the level of, a, of, of empathy and compassion. That comes from my own negotiation of that my own sense of what it means to be an outsider, my own sense of what it means when people have an understanding of you that may not represent exactly the you that is inside and therefore not wanting to reproduce that same experience and or harm on others, but nevertheless feeling, we, as I keep saying, that I have to hold you accountable because we all have work to do. And too often it's been the case that as my white friends, they've been able to not, they've been able to tune it out, turn it off and walk away because it doesn't harm, doesn't appear to harm their lives. Well, I think that gets to one of the bigger questions that 
society has been grappling with more explicitly over the last 15 months. Um, and I'm going to put it a little crassly, and please take that and do with it as you will, um, but is the work of racial justice work that Black people have to do? Is it work that only white people have to do? Do we all have to find a way to do this together? Are all three of these true statements in their own respective ways? Well, I, I you know, as I answer that question, I want to also be really mindful of and considerate of like, you know, movements for Asian, Asian Americans and the ways in which that racial, their racial narrative is, needs to be uplifted and centered in these conversations around race. And same thing with my Latinx folks and folks from South Asian descent, like people, like what we're, what we're naming is that folks have a very, have shared experiences with this and they also have, so they have intersecting and we have independent or unique or distinct experiences inside this sort of racial experiences that we're all walking through. This, the, the, the call to action that I think has become so paramount in this past year has to do a lot with institutions. And the institutions we have to recognize and acknowledge are largely operated, run, and managed by white people. You know, it is, I write about in the book, you know, I have a lot of clients that I've been able to work with and what is profoundly interesting to me, but also shocking to me that people think it's somehow that they are an anomaly is that most of the people that I work with, they feel like their situation is unique. Meaning like our senior leadership team is all white and they think, and they'll say it in hushed tones or there's like a, a level of sort of guilt around that. And I keep trying to tell people that's what racism is. Right? That's what it means. It's not like you're not, you're living inside of a context that is racialized and, and this is what it looks, this is how it manifests. So you are not unique actually. It is more unique to see something completely different from that reality, but more, more sort of, so that means you have, as white people have incredible um, both power in this in, in this in this conversation because of resources and the ways in which resources have been distributed historically, and there's an opportunity. But it's the question of to what extent that work will really be done. Because as I point out in the book, historically we've seen this before. We've been in moments, you know, in the late '60s when we had right. you know, the summit. We've had we had the we had a period in the late '60s and early '70s where it seemed as though, and then the silent majority stepped up and said, hey, actually, you know what? I'm voting for Richard Nixon here because I want law and order. And that sends us sort of down another pathway. So I just, I want people to be clear that this up, this sort of uptick of interest is not a new phenomenon. It might be new for a generation, but we have seen this pattern and cycle. And it tends to focus, it tends to result in at some point in time, white people get tired of working of the racial justice work, or they feel as though there's been enough work done on behalf of people of color, we can stop doing that work and the rollback begins. And that's when we see the rollback. Is there any sense that this might be different? <laughs> so, I mean, like- um, Or history will tell, right? I mean, of course, history will tell. Like, I think that what's, what, we're, what we have now is more access to, I think, information to hold accountability. So for instance, we know that there were some $50 billion worth of pledges that were made directly that were linked to racial justice and that, a, that, a, that a, only a pittance of that has actually been deployed. So where's the money? There's, that is, that, and that accountability is real. And so just don't go silent. That's what I think we're trying to, we're asking a real legitimate question. You said you were gonna make these pledges. You said you made this pledge. You said you were gonna make this investment in this. A year later, you haven't done it. Can you talk to us about why? So there's like there's opportunities for accountability, but what we also are seeing is that the that the pushback is is even swifter than it's ever been historically. So this quote this quote unquote pushback against critical race theory and education in schools and around race in schools it's so, it's been so swift relative to even how we've seen it historically that it is alarming and that it is troubling to see how many people are allowing themselves to fall pray to what is clearly a politi political agenda around a falsification of what this actual thing is about. And so I do worry that um, in as much as clearly gains have been made in terms of representation, meaning we are seeing more people of color, more black people, more black women in positions, more people are getting, so that's representational, that doesn't necessarily mean we're seeing shifts in equity because equity is about policy and practice. It is about systems. And that is not necessarily just about of a face in the room that is different than it has, was a year ago. So the question is open to me around that. And what I do find, unfortunately, at times is that when we get to that 
level of changing policy, of changing systems, their pe people are still stuck there. There's still a stuckness around that because it does require a shift in values. It might require an adoption of some new beliefs and, and that is harder. And so I, I do worry. And you, uh, you also see uh, this um, attack on voter rights and yes. various state level initiatives yeah. that are, could also be seen as, a, as part of a backlash to progress uh, or apparent doubt. progress. Without a doubt. I mean, in the swiftness of it, and I'm not obviously the best person to speak specifically on, on what's happening around voter suppression, but the linkages of, if you look at the states that are sort of passing these, these, uh, these new laws to prevent educate, pre pre prevent like the teaching of, uh, of history and like real and true history, they're, they're mapping very, they're mapping very well with the same, same states that have passed these voter suppression laws. And it's largely because a lot of these states, a lot of these policymakers are linked to some of the same policy think tanks. You know, and we have to be very, and I talk about this a lot in the work that I'm doing, and even in the book, I talk quite often about and frequently about the role that many conservative think tanks can play around building an ideology or at least an ideological framework that makes racism palatable because it uses other kinds of words and it deploys a sort of arsenal of, of terminology and it and knows how to artfully, and I do say artfully in an intentional way, to stoke some of the, the the latent resentments and feelings of, of 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 in some way unfairness that that some white people feel around how race plays out in America, and so this is of no different. I mean, for me, I saw it start to happen last summer with, you know, publications like the National Review began to publish stories such to the effect of you know systemic racism isn't real. So that was part one. You start to dis you start to create the notion that this is not true. And then the, the next the next phase of the undermining of the of the sort of process and progress of change begins after that. And so it's important for us to just document this stuff because it falls into a pattern and it's happened before. And I want my readers as they go back on their own life journey, whether it's parallel to mine or their own journey, to think similarly. How were ideas being deployed in society and how was I reacting to those ideas? Did I did I find myself falling in line with them? Did I find myself resisting them? Did I do deeper learning? Or was I allowing myself to sort of be drawn in by whatever emotional appeal that felt like it was making to me? And that I think is where critical op opportunities for disruption and critical thinking and analysis can yield different outcomes lives. And the movement towards accountability feels very real in this time. And, you know, I think the ubiquity of cell phones and the ability to capture on video has proven a, a resource, um, particularly when it has come to incidents of police brutality and some fatal killings. And so, um, you know, I, I, I wanna turn if we could to um, the section that you, you talk about as the culture of disbelief yeah. and you link this to in some ways, um, when the grand jury exonerated Breonna Taylor's killers. Yeah. Um, could, could you talk us through what you mean by the culture of disbelief and how this provides an opportunity for coming to terms with, um, with the reality? Yeah. I mean, I think foundationally and fundamentally, we have decided without necessarily expressing as much that that certain Americans are true and real and authentic Americans. And therefore the stories they tell are true and, and true and real and authentic American stories. And that other folks are hyphenated Americans and the stories that they tell are conditional, conjectural, can be called into question at any given time and can be denied. And particularly if those two stories might challenge my narrative and what I have come to believe is the only narrative that becomes really problematic. And if I am amongst the dominant group, because we are talking about this in a very trial, if I'm amongst the dominant group, then I'm going to be able to exert my view of the world without much contestation. So this culture of disbelief, and I played with the idea of culture of denial, culture of disbelief, but there's these three chapters in the book that I'm really trying to explore certain harms that I think racism does to white people, you know? And disbelief is one of them. And disbelief specifically as it relates to the stories that black people tell, about their experiences in the world. 
whether it's in the healthcare industry, we see people talk. I have friends who are in the medical industry, but I've read the data myself, or you talk where there are people who express, I am, I am experiencing this pain, I have these symptoms, but if I'm a black person, the likelihood of me being given the same quality and level of a treatment is different than if I was a white person. That is about disbelief. The similarly, we can see it in systems of justice where we have juries, particularly predominantly and all white juries are prone to disbelieve a black person who is on trial, particularly on trial for having killed a white person, right? There's a disbelief that's already baked in. So I can look across systems and this is why I try to have a conversation at the systems level, because when we look across systems, we see the disbelief manifesting itself in many different forms. And fundamentally is it about, you're telling me a story that doesn't align with my truth and my reality because I have a different lens through which I see the world. So rather than deal with it and reckon with it and believe that you maybe are telling the truth, I'm going to deny it and disbelieve it until I have a cell phone footage that will show this happened. And even then we just still disbelieve. And even then we had to be in bated breath in May, in April, I should say, we were waiting. We had this, even then we have to be like, I don't know, because that's how deep the culture of disbelief is. And perhaps that, dis that disbelief will need to be turned towards the narratives that perhaps we have been taught in school um, yeah. or we have had passed down um, from family to family or yeah. um, in more in some parts of the country than in others. Each, each, yeah. each part of the country has a local narrative that local narrative, yeah. could do with a little disbelief perhaps. And, and the thing is, is that I want to also be clear is that, you know, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a firm believer in a both and, you know, you know, I think some folks have anxiety about this new insertion, the insertion of narratives that have been excluded as a means by which to, to completely and utterly displace what other folks, you know, particularly what white folks narratives are in their history. And that's not what this is about. This is about maybe I use the word complexifying it a bit. It is about complexifying those narratives to make it a richer and fuller story so that we don't have younger folks who grew up in, in their 20s and 30s are first are having their first awakening to these things, which I think was what we're encountering is that a lot of people I've even encountered in their 40s, 50s, having their first awakening. And you go through these periods of shame and, and I can't believe I and we could we could actually we could cut against that stuff if we'd allowed ourselves and trusted young people because that's what also is happening is we're not trusting young people to be able to draw conclusions, to make assertions, to disaggregate and to distinguish between. So they, there's an assumption that any kind of confrontation or reckoning with white, the history of white people in America will therefore make a white young white child feel terrible about themselves and feel like that's not, I think people have more resilience than that. First of all, there's much more, there's a myriad of other sort of reflections of identity that they're being exposed to on a daily basis that are countering any kind of narrative that they have for one hour, for a day in a classroom. They're all over the, so I just, I, that's just really baffling to me that this is an assumption that, that people can't, that young people as well, can't sustain and hold complex understandings of our world and that that can't benefit us all. I'm, I'm drawn to this notion of, um, complexifying because um, it actually is an additive approach to history yeah. um, of perhaps putting back what was elided. Um, but there are there are reasons, sometimes bad, why yeah. these alternate narratives um, uh, grew up. And so, if we were to lose those completely, maybe we, they shouldn't be centered. Maybe they, we shouldn't lead with them. But if we lose them completely. We're, we lose some of the opportunity to learn from why there are these different narratives to begin with. Yes, I, I could not agree more with you. I, 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 I am a believer in that's not, we, it's not about canceling history. We're not doing, it's not about canceling history. And, it's, and, and I think that, you know, I am a believer that, you know, someone can have had and done something that is really bad to my people and they still could have done something that is beneficial to the society we live in. They could have done things that they could have loved. It doesn't mean that they weren't letting people, they didn't love their families. It means though that that is an area of their life that we have to look at and understand there was a huge gap and it was a deep problem that we can't just allow ourselves to gloss over. But I think we can do this. And I think in America, we've had to be shown the ability 
to like resuscitate people's lives. Like we have this tendency to throw people out, but then we restore them 20 years later, you know? So we had this sort of ongoing engagement with, you know, the people that we've lifted up. And sometimes I actually think that the problem is that we put them too high on a pedestal from the very beginning. So if we start, if we do this elevation thing, then all we do is put them in a place where all we can, where ultimately they're going to have to do, we're going to bring them down, if you will. But I'm, I'm of the belief that we can hold people have done great things and important things and also have done things that they, that we are not proud of, that are problematic, and that actually are harmful. And um, there's a lot more in the book that we're not touching on tonight because we do want people to go read, read it from cover to cover or dip into different letters when they get their own copy. But, but I want to turn to what I think is Act 3, um, where you're, you're actually you're giving us formal advice, guidance on, um, on new attitudes to adopt. And um, I, I, there's, are there a couple of things, a couple of points that you'd like to... Um, bring forward in tonight's conversation that, that are important for the white male friends and, and, and who, they, who they represent. Yeah. You know, I, I mean, I, I talk about a few different frameworks in the book, particularly this sort of lens framework, which is, you know, a, a new way potentially for people to approach conversations that are difficult, which is, you know, the acronym is that, you know, start from a place of listening and learning really employ empathy that can be derived from points in your own life and you've experienced being sort of either oppressed or being, you know, beginning to name and notice your own physiological response to conversations or to, to people who might, um, who you might in encounter as different and use that as data and use that as a way to lean in. And then ultimately, you know, use, use all that information to, to begin to engage in your actions. I call those the speaking part of it. So I think the lens framework can be helpful for folks in institutional context. But I think, you know, from a philosophical standpoint, I also want to, in that, that part three, to really reckon with and challenge people to reckon with um, what, why, what, what do they hope to gain out of being in this struggle? Is it that you are in this because you believe that fundamentally we need to shift and change as a society? Or is it because there is um, some other selfish motivation that is really just about, you know, if, if it's like about not being seen as on the wrong side of history, or if it's about, you know, you see change happening and you wanna make sure that you're, like, I want people to just be clear on the authentic drives behind their choices right now, because what I don't wanna see happen is that we make an assumption about what you want and what you believe this movement about is about is aligned with what I want and I believe this movement is about. And if you haven't asked me, there's no way you can possibly know. So I do, I, I encourage people to do that reflection around what they want and then also to be in conversation with people. But a couple of specific points that I will lay out, I think are just, you know, I, I, I really want folks particularly, and I found this a lot in corporate work that I do, there's a, there's a challenge that people have around focusing on race. Um, and it's often a desire to shift the conversation to everything else and anything else besides just the Nate, just the real, real deal brass tacks of we have a race problem here. And being able to say it without feeling as though that makes you therefore a bad person or it's like we have a race problem everywhere in this country. So it stands to reason that in this institution, we probably have one too. And, you know, and I think there's often a desire to obscure the conversation, to avoid it, to talk about these other diversity things that we're doing when we don't focus on the fact that there is a particular strain of anti-Black racism that exists in this country that is very much rooted in our history. And if we're not focused and clear about how we're going to try to address that problem, then we're not going to address that problem. Because historically, we have demonstrated that Black people are the, the one that they're like, we are the sort of polarity, if you will. And we are much more as a country, much more hospitable and open to other quote unquote minorities assimilating into the American identity than black people. And it's largely because sometimes we just don't wanna, we will not conform. We actually are going to, we believe that we have a voice here, a stake here and have been here. And we don't believe that we just need to kind of show up the way you told us to show up. And so that gets us excluded from opportunity. We get deemed as loud or we don't have this or whatever. I want people to just understand that we have been here, have a right to be here, and not just as a physical being, but even in our institutional structures, how do we reshape them to allow for the, the sort of ability for more people to be themselves and to show up whole inside of the, inside of the institutional construct. So that's important. And then I just say the last thing is just be prepared to be in this work for a while. You know, like I, I do believe that folks want to get out of this. They just want to get out of it. 
And so we're gonna create this new boogeyman, which is critical race theory. We're gonna move the, we're gonna do whatever we can to not to get out of the, get out of this conversation. And I just tell you, we're gonna be back in it in another generation if we don't deal with it now. So that's my only, those are things that I would encourage. And there's a lot more obviously in there that we're not gonna give it all away, but I'm not holding anything back, but you know, it's, it's a lot more in the book around guidance. And I don't call it advice. I just call it, I'm gonna share some ways I approach problems because I don't believe I have the answers for you on what you should do because situations are different and people have to choose relative to their situation. But, but many of the um, um, guidances, not advice, guidances, um, um, are reflections on your work in the corporate, corporate and institutional space. So they, they um, uh, I think they are all the more powerful because they have a basis in in the lived experience of doing this work in that sector or in those sectors, yes. Um, yes. which which brings it real. Um, you know, I mean, I think you you at the very end are, are saying yes, it is about the next generation, but the work to do this for the next generation, if it doesn't start now, it's the generation after that. So, yeah. um, so I don't I don't feel that that's um, uh, kicking the can down the road or. Right. Uh, avoiding the problem um and I, I was equally also, i think and i'm yes, just also like connected to that is when we say it's about the next generation it's about the choices we're making in the now as well specifically as it relates to education i go back to that you know i live in a part of dc that you know is you know it's, it's fairly you know it's fairly a sort of mixed mixed race but i mean it's dc is dc but one of the things that i have encountered is that you know when people are raising their children and their children get to a certain age and they have the affluence and the ability to do so, they move them to another part of the city where quote unquote better schools are, but are typically gonna be less diverse. And I'm not saying that people need to make decisions that are gonna be, hold, they're gonna put their children at risk of having a bad education, but it is to say that, you know, the kinds of choices that we make around how we're gonna sort of socialize and educate our children are, and, and what we deem as education too, is education only the thing that happens in the classroom when the teacher's in the front of the room or is education the thing that happens in the playground? Is it the thing that happened for me on the basketball court? Is it the thing that happens because I'm, I'm, I'm bumping up against different kinds of people? So I just wanna encourage folks to think about when they're about to make those kinds of choices that will ultimately, because of the nature of segregation patterns in our society and the ways in which wealth distribution operates, the more we make decisions that are purely about our that, that are purely aligned with our affluence and ability to move out, we are going to be in a, you're going to be in a wider place, and your children are going to have fewer experiences and interactions with people that are different from them. That is actually part of the choice you're making. So you might be choosing on one hand what is perceived as a very positive choice. I'm getting the best school education, but what you're also giving up is something that is also equally valuable to their ability to navigate an increasingly sort of new uh, an increasingly diverse society that we live in. And so you got to think about those and your way and your options. And that's a bit of the advice. So, so it's, it's, I mean, we talked earlier about, you know, that the racism that most people in this work are dealing with is the systemic problem, the policy yes. work. Yes. Yes. It cannot be divorced from the individual choices that one makes in one's life. Um, so, so in some ways, it, 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 it always has to remain a matter of individual, individual choice through an equity lens, but in the, in the service and in the work of solving systemic problems. Yeah. And that's why it's important that we are aligned in and have a shared definition of what the problem is that we're trying to solve. I think one of the things I've encountered quite often and even the work that I'm doing is that we don't even have a shared definition. We have different views of what everything means. So therefore we're not aligned to even what we're up to. And so when we talk about, when I talk about, when others talk about trying to create a systemic analysis is that, you know, we're trying to, we're trying to help develop a shared lens for the history, for the challenges that, that have been baked into our systems so that we can have a shared approach to how we're gonna deconstruct these things. But if I keep coming to this and I had someone reach out to me the other day and, you know, he was saying that, you know, I'm a, I'm a white man, but I'm poor. I grew up poor. I grew up in poverty. And I should not say poor because poor is a poor is, a, is, a, is not the way I define it. It's living in poverty is a very different thing than being poor. So he grew up living in poverty. And he says, I don't benefit from white privilege. And I said to him in my response, like, I'm not 
I hope in my book, you don't encounter me writing specifically about white, white privilege as systemic racism. I think white privilege is a handmaiden of systemic racism. It is actually, it, it is operationalized and weaponized by systemic racism, but systemic racism is the thing that we're trying to get at. And that is not about you as an individual. And you don't have to necessarily benefit in the ways that you think you're supposed to benefit in order for it to be a system that is still oppressing other people. You know, so even though you might not be benefiting, it doesn't mean it's not other people that are being actively, in, you know, actively oppressed, which is different. Right. I mean, I, and I think, you know, we also talked earlier about, um, you know, ensuring the momentum of this moment keeps going. And yeah. one fear that you talk about, these are my words, not yours, in the, the last section in the corporate space is effectively either A, corporations paying lip service to principles of DEI work more broadly, like, yeah, we'll include more uh, people of color in advertising or fill in the blank, yeah. um, but equally uh, looking to your DEI leadership as a way of letting you off the hook in some, in some ways. Or I think, I think you give an example of a CEO wanting to have this person effectively become their, co their executive coach. Right. rather than a true partner in the work. Right. And I think that, you know, I, that's why I frame this as a competency issue. You know, we need everyone, you know, and when you are when you're a leader in an organization, you're expected to have certain competencies. And so the question is, if this is now a competency, how do you get it? And if you are unwilling to get it, do you are you still entitled to have that job? Because if, the, if a competency is being able to talk across difference to all the people that you're leading and they're coming from different walks of life and you have not developed the ability to do that and have not demonstrated an aptitude or interest in doing that, then that to me seems like that's a real competency issue that you're not living up to and fulfilling the responsibilities of the job. The job, I say, the job has changed. The job has changed. You know, we change people's jobs quite often. We write job descriptions and we change the job descriptions. Why should it only happen to the people who are junior in an organization? Why should it not be also people who are senior as well? Because if we want to have an equitable ex experience, then everybody has to be accountable to this, to this work and live it out and live it through. Um, I'm going to turn to a few audience questions uh, as we're just coming up on our, our first hour. Uh, we'll go a little bit longer. Uh, we have a few from registration and one or two coming in. Uh, for yep. those of you watching live, feel free to add a, another question in the Q&A box and we'll try and get to those too. Um, and where is uh, my question from earlier? Um, so um, let us start with um, the question that is lined up um, from Angela. My son is always facing the ridicule of being an Uncle Tom by his friends. Do you confront some of this in your book or would you like to comment on this quandary? Yeah, um, thank you for that question, first of all. Um, that is a really hard thing to hear. I'm really sorry that, you're young, that, that a young person is, is having to grapple with something that maybe not even understand the terminology. It's a term that's been passed down, used, and it's often deployed in a way to, to belittle them, to humanize people. So that's, that's just not okay. I do write about, um, you know, I would not say that I was explicitly sort of uh, like called out in that way, but what I would say is that just by merely in relationship to some of my friends, particularly my basketball friends, the kids I grew up playing ball with, if I'm in relationship to them, it appeared at the superficial level that I had more access, more opportunity, went to went to this fancy school or lived in a, that, that, that predisposed me to being, you know, to a kind of, a kind of ridicule. And it was actually a very, for me, a very shameful experience to have to live through. I used to hate when my coaches would drop us off at home at my house because I didn't want anybody to see where I lived. And I lived in a very modest home, but relative to where my friends were living, they were living in a much different environment. And so I had a lot of shame around that. And they would, they treated me as if in some ways I had to earn my respect from them. And that earning took a long time. And I understood that I was entering, and I talk about this, I enter, I'm entering in their world and I'm entering their experience. And their resentment that they hold towards me is legitimate in their view. And it's not my job to, to argue with them about that, but it is my job for me in that experience, at least. I wanted to be in that world. I wanted to play on that team. I was venturing into, into that experience. I didn't have to do that. So I had to, I had to, you know, to learn to navigate it. I would say with, you know, with this, I don't know the context of this young, of your, your son's experience. 
Um, I hope he can get some value out of the book because I do think that he might see some some kindred experiences in there that allow him to understand that he's not alone. He's not the first and what he's going through can give him some, maybe some tools to navigate his current experiences. But again, I'm just, I'm sorry that that's actually reality he's having to face. Thank you. Um, the next question it asks, have you lost or discarded any of your white male friends who are unable to come to terms with this racial reckoning? Some loaded terms in there. Well, it's put a strain on some relationships. Yes, it has. It has put, I would say the vast majority, no. The vast majority of my, of my, of my white male friends, you know, it's, um, you know, what I encountered is in, an incredible desire to learn, to understand, and even to commit to some action in their world, in their workforce, in their space. And these are a lot of my, and I do, you know, a lot of my friends are in places of influence, varying degrees of influence. And I do, I do demonstrate, you know, uh, tomorrow I have a book party here in DC and one of, and it's being hosted by two of my white friends here in DC. They said, listen, we're throwing a party. With, you know, and that's them demonstrating. We want to, uh, we want to, and we want to invite our friends so that they can, so that's, that's them demonstrating in their ways. But I do have friends who I think are really wrestling with the idea that systemic racism is a real phenomenon. And it to somehow, and it often is, and it invariably is linked to their own sense that they have not, um, benefited from the ways in which they believe, if it were the case that systemic racism is real in their minds as a white man, then they should be farther along. They should have more, they should be being, they should feel by experiencing more success. So there's that on one hand. And then there's sometimes I think a sense that by having a little bit of cultural awareness around culture, around like music and around style, that that gives you an automatic deeper understanding of some of the racial dimensions that are at play around you. And there's an unwillingness or, or disinterest in looking deeper in how you've decided potentially to cherry pick the parts of black culture that you like, and you don't really engage with other parts of black culture that do not actually line up with or provide you with some additional credibility or additional sort of, you know, cachet. So you want the parts or you are drawn to the parts that, that, that are, that give you benefit, but the parts that you don't either understand or feel like you have no interest in learning about and you or, and you might even stand in judgment of. So I see that. And even I still have love for those folks because I mean, they've been there for me in other ways and it's hard, but that's how it is in family. But I'm also going to, we're going to talk about it. We're not going to, I'm not going to just, you know, I'm not going to let, you know, and they're going to want to talk about it with me. And so it's an ongoing thing where he think they, he might think he's right now. And it's tough. It's really hard. You know, it's really hard. You know, that, that's interesting that, that those are examples of some of the more difficult aspects for this particular group of friends to get to get around it's uh it's believing that way well, they haven't they haven't themselves been doing anything wrong in this regard right or sure. um yeah. no uh, i probably haven't but but yeah. that doesn't mean they haven't benefited from um from privilege uh, or from a system that keeps other people back to use your your terms from earlier yeah and it doesn't mean addition to that and i appreciate your point it doesn't mean also that um you know and i and i also find that sometimes well, they'll say like, look at you, you're doing fine. We're like use of individual success. And yes, black folks are doing very well and very much. So, but using, that is not helpful actually, right? That is not a helpful way to which to kind of equate one individual's, we're talking about millions of people. We're looking at reams of data that demonstrates we're stealing of the wealth divide is as wide as it was 50 years ago. Like that's not what we're talking about. So don't get caught up because you see a, a black guy driving a nice car. Don't get caught up because you see black basketball players making millions of dollars. Don't get caught up because you see Jay-Z a billion. Don't, don't, don't get caught up in that way because I can't even name all the white billionaires. The fact that you can name the two or three black millionaires, that should tell you something right there. So let's just not get caught up in these very symbolic and important ways in which black people might be thriving in your view and therefore evidencing the fact that there is no longer any for anything that we need to resolve or try to deal with in our society. And, and you, you gave examples of music and fashion and other uh, sort of creative aspects of culture that, you know, are one step to remove from uh, full on cultural appropriation as well. Perhaps people, it's, it's, about, it's about everyone understanding the roots of particular trends or fashions or, um, uh, or elements that, that we perhaps take for granted. And giving due respect and proper and giving proper respect right. to those who, who might have who've done that work and taking an interest in understanding where does that come from? How did that come to be? And you know, and so it's just it's what I think black folks, because culture is so important to us, you know, culture is what we could we were able to maintain. 
And I was in a conversation with a friend of mine. And we talked about that. You know, why, why does, you know, when we get together, why is race such an important part of our journey, our stories? Our talk? Partly it's because we're experienced, it's a shared experience. And also it's because, you know, it is sort of this tie that has allowed us to understand ourselves as part of a community. So therefore music comes out of that. There's, you know, food that comes out of that. There's, there's, there's literature that comes out of that. There's art, there's creativity, there's industry, there's industry. Like a lot of that is rooted in this sort of shared and base in a culture of around of, that's a culture that's, that's, that's we are determined to, to rise above, to navigate through and to, and to disprove the things. And that is as a deep pride in that that we take, I think. I don't think I know. Um, and that's culture. And I think we, we look at, sometimes we look at what has been defined and people say, I'm, I have white friends who's like, well, what is my culture? I don't know. What is white culture? And I think that's often a challenge that people have around this stuff. Like what is, and I think that's actually an opportunity because to what, it, to what, I, from what I experienced in many ways, white culture tends to manifest itself as consumer culture in America. It doesn't necessarily, now there's ethnic cultures that people have around Italian and Irish, or there's ethnic culture experience. But I think when we talk about whiteness, it is very sort of like, it is part of, it is linked very much to capitalism and to commercialism. And it is linked very much to external acquisition and demonstration, some of which black folks as Americans have adopted as well. You know, So it is a complex tapestry, but it, just trying to have some interest in it is what I ask people. Because I think there's just often been very little interest in, in how things are, why they are, why are black communities the way they are? Why do you go to all parts of America and black people seem, there are, there are communities where black folks are living in poverty. Why is that? Well, disinvestment happens just systematically and strategically all over the country. You know, redlining, of course we know. So that's, that's just what I invite my friends and, and want them to do is more deeper investigation and exploration. Um, changing topics, this next question, I think it's from, Oh, let me, where is it gone? It just moved on me. Um, sorry. <laughs> um, when did you first know you had a voice in this conversation? Uh, maybe it's your first written piece, your first reflection, your first um, speech. I, I, I don't know. When, when, um... I, I appreciate that question. I really do. Um, you know, I tell this for me, you know, I was back in, when I was in college. I, uh, and I, I write about this in the book as well. I, got arrested at a, at a protest. Um, and it was, and I always say I was a dilettante. I was not a, I was not anybody who was involved in any kind of politics about anything. It was, I ended up at a rally and, you know, and somehow I ended up being one of the small group of people that was arrested as a result of that and had to go through a trial. Like I had to go through some of the, you know, this is like reckless endangerment because we had blocked up, you know, it was like political stuff and I'm not a political person. But afterwards I ended up writing a piece about my experience and people seemed drawn to it. And they felt as though that's something I was, I was communicating was in there that they could read that resonated for them. And I think that was for me, again, as a black person, as a young black man, because I had at that point, 20 years old, 21 years old, I was no longer a basketball player, which had been a big part of my de defining of myself, you know, and that had been, been not just because I defined myself, but because the institutions I was in, that was how that, that was the, that was the place I went to get kudos, like people, gave me props because you were good at ball. Like I never, I stopped thinking of myself as a, as a, as a, I never thought of myself as a good writer or as a thinker, as a, I, I knew I was smart, but I didn't think of myself as someone who had like a real contribution to make until I got arrested and had to be, and I got sort of politicized and then started to do some deep reading and then started to kind of just feel this passion and this desire. And, and I think more than anything, I have a willingness to sit down for 10, 12 hours and work on sentences, you know? And I think it's a lot of people just don't want to do that. Like people don't want to sit down and just sit in a room and write over and over and over again. <laughs> well, I see that with the library all the time. Of course, so you do. You live in a very exceptional world. That's not but yes, no, in general, you're right. <laughs> um, do, do you think that could have come out during a different educational experience? That's a really or, good you question. Have to... That's a really good question. You know, um, you know, what sparks somebody to do. I think, I think if I'm really honest with myself, I don't know. I will yeah. say that because it wasn't as if I felt I was socialized in my community to, to consider political activism or even thinking about being a writer who writes around political and social issues as a desirable or even sort of feasible life choice. 
what was presented to me was much more concrete things. That's why I did go to law school because law school is very tangible. You can hold that thing. You can take that degree and you can do something. Generationally, if you think about it from my, my father tells the story that, you know, um, you know, his father was a, was a, ran a body shop. His father worked with his hands and he was a mechanic so that my dad could be an engineer so that I could be a writer, you know, like it was, there's a right. generational thing that happens. So this is, I have a privilege that my father was a painter, but he couldn't pursue that as a legitimate avenue because it was, he was being dependent upon to go to school and get this very practical degree in engineering and therefore from their point, move on. So I think contextually, I was born at the right time meaning at a, at a point in time in our history when I could grow up with some sense of myself that was not completely sort of shut off. I grew up immersed in a, in a society that was for the first time really in earnest, or at least where I was trying this diversity thing out, you know, trying this multicultural thing out. And so I had a bunch of kids in my neighborhood and we were all our parents would say, we're gonna try this thing out. So contextually, those things were important to creating some of the backdrop that may not, I, not, I might not have been conscious of but that ultimately starts to manifest itself in, in sort of my understanding of the world. But I don't know, had it not been for, I think crisis or at least points of um, conflict are often triggers for people. I, I'm also a big, I read a lot of like, comic books and so I'm all, I'm really big into like origin stories. And it tends to be that every, every superhero, I'm not a superhero by any stretch of magic, every superhero or hero's um, origin story is linked to tra some kind of traumatic experience. If you think about it, like they're all some kind of, I do think that for me, having that kind of mild Trump trauma was important for act to activate my sense of the world and myself in it. Hmm. Um, the uh, next question uh, talks about an interview that you did on NPR on Monday. Um, so um, <laughs> yeah. I heard you on NPR Monday talking about a, a group of white and black yes. males trying to come to terms. Uh, uh, the question didn't ask, maybe you could tell us a little bit about that, what that was. The question is, how can I find one of these groups to, to, to join? Hey, so first of all, I'm so glad you listened. I'm so glad you showed up here. Um, that just, just demonstrates a real interest and earnest and desire to learn. So um, after I wrote my letter last year, a group of guys, white men, got together and started to organize themselves. They built a curriculum, I mean, on their own. I kind of peeked in from here and now, but I was like, y'all wanna see how y'all, what y'all do? I wanna see how this works out. And they committed themselves to this work. And this work was really, they read some of the most challenging texts that you could write and that you could find around, well, around white identity, white male identity, privilege, structural racism, white supremacy culture. They did that work. Um, and then they decided to, or, like, to, to splinter out and, and build more groups to do more of the work together. And so they're still continuing to meet and continuing to do work. And I've done, and I'm, I'm watching some of them apply that work in their, um, in their work lives. So I'm encouraged by it. Um, I will just say that I'm happy to connect you with them. You can reach me at, you know, at, on my email. I'm, I'm always on email, dax at daxdev.com. Um, and you can find me on my website, hit me up on email and I'll connect you with them because uh, I think it's important work. I really admire what these guys are up to. And they're trying to do something I think that is um, that is that is hard, but there's a, a deep commitment that they're demonstrating around what they want, how they want to show up, and I respect it. Thank you. Uh, we can take one or two more questions if there are any burning questions out there. Um, I, I wanted to ask because um, family figures in your um, in your book and in your letters, and so I'm wondering what family reaction to, to this has been like. Oh man, thanks for asking that question. Um, you know, I think my, my mother is, uh, is, in, is in, she's really proud of me. My mom is, uh, you know, she was a race woman from the old, so the old school, meaning she just had a, you know, an organic understanding of an analysis of race and racism in America. And I think, you know, for me to be able to be in a place where I have the space to write and to share my ideas with the world it makes her incredibly proud. My sisters as well, I talk to them all the time. We live, we're very close. And I think for them also, it's giving some articulation to things that, that, that maybe that's been on their hearts and on their minds. You know, my wife is my partner in everything I do. And she, you know, we're not for her, I would have not written this book. I, I tell people, this is my first book in 10 years. I wrote a bunch of books when I was young and then didn't write books for a long time because I wanted to go explore life. I wanted to go and actually do 
different work in the world so that I have something to write about in new ways. And so this book actually does reflect some of the other journeying I've done, but she supported me tremendously. She, she was the one who, after I wrote the letter, was like, you, you need to do some more with this. I was like, no, there's nothing more. But she was like, no, 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 you should do some more with this. Um, so I would not be able to be, so I'm supported by a, a, a tribe of a lot of them, women, you know, strong black women in my life, beautiful black women in my life that love me. My daughter is a huge supportive and she, I don't know what she thinks, but I, I love the fact that one day she'll look on the shelf and she'll see daddy's books next to all these venerable authors. I think it, it just means a lot to me to feel like she'll see that one day. So I appreciate that question because haven't thought about it or been able to express the importance of family in any of these endeavors. You know, they've always supported me and it's been a long journey just to even be a writer. You know, I moved to New York when I was 26 to be a quote unquote writer after finishing law school. And I tell people my first job was making $15 a day in a, at, a, um, at, a, at a publishing house working in the mail room. You know, and I was, I was working in the slush pile, which is all the, all the manuscripts that come in. That, yeah, slush pile, you never heard of it. No. All the manuscripts that people send in that are unsolicited, they go into a pile, it's called the slush pile. And I would read those. So I, it's been a journey, you know, where you just, you're dedicated to storytelling and to being in communication with people. And that's how I feel. And they supported me all the way. Well, I think particularly because um, your father is part of the inspiration for the story and the letters and the book. And, you know, in some ways, uh, even in your opening comments tonight, you, you shared that um, because of the context of his upbringing and his time, um, uh, certain things were possible and certain things were not. And now, um, and now here we are at a, at a different moment. Different moment, yeah, really. He's been, pa he passed away a number of years ago, which is sort of unfathomable. It's been 16 years since he passed, almost 17 years since he passed away. It's crazy to think, but he just, you know, my father was really, and actually I quote one of the letters he wrote to me um, in the book. And I never really made the connection until after I started working the book that, but my father communicated to me through letters, you know, all through my twenties up until the time he passed away, he would, we'd have late night conversations because he lived on the West coast and I lived in the East coast. I call him late at night and we talk about, he was a philosopher and, and he would, I would, a few days later, invariably I get a letter in the mail, you know, and it would be something about what we talked about. And he's got book, he'd have books connected to it. He'd, he'd have a stack of books in the, in the envelope and, and so letters are were an important, they continue to be an important way to communicate. And I think there's something special about a letter, especially in this day and age, that just is its own distinct phenomenon of experience. And that's part of why I wanted to have this book be that, because this is a public discourse that we're having around this. But I know that there's a lot of personal history that people have. And especially for my white friends, there's a lot of, it's difficult to be in these conversations because sometimes I think a lot of my friends don't feel like they can say anything right. Like there's nothing that as a white man I can do right now. I think some of my friends feel like I go left and something wrong, I go right and something wrong. And so they are looking for, at least some of them are looking for places they can go and people and conversations they can be in and relationships they can have with people that are willing to, to work and learn with them. Um, you know, and I'm one of those people. And I'd, I'd rather try and get it wrong than not try at all. And um, I, I, so far that's been received well from my my <laughs> friends and so um, good man good good you know it's not it's not right for every context there is systemic work that we have to do and we can't afford to get that wrong but I think so much of this starts with with the with the personal and yeah. Um, yeah. with getting to know each other um, right. better too and that's the arc of the book I mean that's people I mean the structure of the book is built in three parts and it is intentionally designed to start with the personal to lead toward a systemic conversation. Because I have learned in my work that if you start at the systemic level, you lose people right away. Because you're trying to, you, you have to get at people's hearts and you have to get at people's lives and experiences and they'll walk on the journey with you. And it takes a little longer sometimes, but that's part of the work. Well, I am, my final comment, um, and then if you wanna share a, a, few, a few words. Um, but my final thought is, is simply that, um, you and your work are the next generation for your father. And so I think that that bookended narrative um, just helps come through. It's, it's subtle, but it's, but it's definitely there. So, so thank you for being that. Um, Dax, are there any final thoughts you'd like us to take away from tonight's conversation? Um, you know, I think I just want people to not be afraid of this book. 
and likewise not to be afraid of 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 even if there's emotion that people are expressing that emotion is linked to passion and passion doesn't cloud judgment necessarily and it doesn't mean that people don't have an analysis of what's going on it doesn't mean that people aren't clear it just means that people are determined and so I'm those who might be enter, entering this conversation from a place of trepidation or skepticism or just defensiveness. My hope is that this book allows you to feel as though you're in being invited into this work, this conversation, that there's a belief, I do believe that you're needed in it. We can't do it without everybody having some contribution and meaningful contribution. And we're gonna to have to do some work around repair, which involves, you know, maybe some radical redistribution of opportunity, you know, all those sorts of things. So that's gonna be uncomfortable and it might feel, but there's no other, I just don't see how else we are going to be able to tackle this without us being able, without us making some really definitive and hard and radical changes to the way we've designed our society, whether it's the way we've designed our tax systems, the way we've designed our sort of school systems, our policies, we have to do things differently and believe that that's going to actually be to all of our benefit, you know? And as long as you don't believe that there's something in it for you, then you probably won't buy into it. But if you understand that this, the way that the society is shut up, while you might feel superficially like it doesn't affect you, it does affect you. I say, if you could look at the murder of any child or young or black man leading up to George, George Floyd, if any, if none of those hurts your heart, if none of, if you, if you're not seeing Alton Sterling get shot in the back while he was running in the park, if that, didn't, if that didn't do something to you, if you still stood in your ground and said, you know what, he did something wrong, he deserved it, he should have just listened, then you, then something is, that's an affliction. That's part of what we're getting at right here. Like that's not okay that you think there is some justifiable reason to shoot somebody in that way or to strangle somebody on the street corner for, 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 for smoke, for selling cigarettes. And you know, if, if that is something that you are processing as, as a rational response to a behavior, that has been exhibited that that was not life-threatening that is what i'm talking about about harm because you have there's something there's something around your your own humanity and your own ability to see and experience the humanity of others has not been fully developed or needs to be better brought in better alignment with the world we're in and that's all and that's all <laughs> dax thank you so much for sharing um your your book and yes. for sharing um, your thoughts in, in conversation this evening. And hopefully we'll, we'll get to meet in person at, at, at some right. point as we get right. back to doing that once again. Thank you. For being and now for- Thank you for just being a great host. I appreciate you coming prepared and ready to talk about this stuff. So thank you. I wanna just let you know, I appreciate you. Thank you so much. And now for our audience, a few words about upcoming programs. Uh, on this first slide, uh, we have notes about three upcoming author talks. Um, Christina Viviana Gregor on the education trap, schools and the rem remaking of inequality in Boston. Followed by Peter Canellos, The Great Dissenter, the story of John Marshall Harlan, America's judicial hero. And then on July 20th, Judith Human, disability rights activist and author of Rolling Warrior and Being Human. And then two programs that we wanted to share with you uh, next week that I uh, am actually hosting. Um, uh, the first is an online conversation um, on supporting youth artists in the virtual realm, where we will talk to uh, staff members and partner organizations about how they engage young people using um, Twitch, music and other forms of youth engagement during the pandemic. And then on Wednesday, June 30th, here at the Central Library in Boston, in the courtyard, we will introduce the Youth Poet Laureate of Boston, Alondra Babadilla's uh, new work with clipped wings uh, for a book launch here in the courtyard. Please join us for any of these programs and continue to follow us online at bpl.org for more information about these and other programs. Until next time, please be safe, be well, and we'll see you at the library.